Have we screwed it up so badly here on this planet that our only hope is to build a new civilization out there? No, not at all. I, actually, I'm, I'm quite optimistic about the future of humanity on Earth. You are? Yeah, absolutely. So what is the benefit to humanity then to inhabit Mars, which is really what is an ambition of yours? Well, I think if you consider two paths, one where we're forever confined to Earth and the other where we're a space frank civilization out exploring the stars, I think the latter is far more exciting and will result in a, a richer and, and more diverse human experience. How can you do that better than NASA? Well, NASA is a customer of ours. So there's, a, I think, a confusion in the public mind that perhaps a company like SpaceX is competing with NASA, mm -hmm. but in fact, NASA is a customer of ours. So we're actually providing services to NASA, launch services. And when the shuttle retires in 2010, so starting in 2011, SpaceX's rocket will replace the space shuttle in servicing the space station with astronauts and cargo transportation. The name of your rocket ship is called the Falcon Explorer, is that it? Well, the, the Falcon 9. The Falcon 9 yeah, is, is the rocket, and the spaceship is Dragon. Dragon. Yeah, so the Falcon 9 rocket lifts the Dragon spaceship, and the Dragon spaceship is what goes to the space station and then returns to Earth. So it transports the Falcon as almost cargo? So, the, yeah, the, the Falcon 9 is kind of like the, uh, the semi okay. or, or something like that. Falcon 9 booster rocket takes the Dragon spaceship to space and drops it off. Mm -hmm. Then it goes to docks with the space station, transfers astronauts or resupply, you know, cargo, whatever the case may be, and then the Dragon spacecraft turns to Earth. Reading some of the speeches that you have given in your career, and you're 23 years old? I'm actually 12. You're 12. Yeah. I was going to say, <laughs> you look terrific. But you have said that we we got lost along the way with our space program. What did you mean by that? Right, I think I, that was uh, some of my congressional testimony. I, I gave a few yes. speeches to, to Congress. Well, what I mean by that is, in 1969, we were able to go to the moon. And here we are, over three decades later, and we can barely get to low Earth orbit. And I think by any measure, that is a step backwards. Is that for a lack of leadership or technology? I think we made the wrong technological choices, and I think there was also a lack of will at the highest levels of government to take the next step and go at least stay on the moon and perhaps build a base there mm -hmm. and then go beyond the moon to Mars. And if you look at the, the news articles in the late 60s, early 70s, the expectation uh, was that, that by now, in, in the 21st century, we would have a moon base and probably even a Mars base. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think if you'd asked anyone at that point in time whether we would be unable to go to the moon and not have been to Mars, I think they would think you're crazy. Do we need a leadership in that realm? Do we need a John F. Kennedy who sets a goal <laughs> for us when he said, one day a man will walk on the moon. Do we need that kind of leadership for this technology to move forward in that big step? I do think it's very important that the president set the priority and determine the goal that we as a nation will aspire to. Mm -hmm. And, you know, George Bush has his pluses and minuses, but at least one plus is that he has helped to steer the space program in a direction that, that more or less makes sense. You know, the only thing I would sort of argue with is that I don't think we should be going back to the moon. I think we should be focused on Mars. Mm -hmm. I think we saw the... Think you think that's a mistake, focusing on the moon? I think we should rather be focused on Mars. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the moon is kind of like the Arctic. I mean, it's just a very barren place and very little resources, it's small. It's not really a place that we could establish another human civilization. There's a feeling of been there, done that, too, with the moon. Yeah, I think we there? saw that movie in the <laughs> 60s, you know, and the remake's never as good. Did we really go to the moon? Uh, yes, I'm, yes, we, we did. We definitely okay, went I just to wanted moon. to check. Uh, <laughs> The government is incapable of, of suppressing a conspiracy of that nature. Of that nature. So, okay, good. This ambition to explore space. Absolutely. As that, an that, entrepreneur. There's, there's quite a bit yeah. of competition mm -hmm. out there. There's Jeff Bezos with Blue Origin. There's Richard Branson with his Virgin Galactic. Right. And I'm not talking about NASA either. There's Paul Allen. There's the European Space Agency and Boeing and Lockheed Martin. The Chinese, the Russians. Let's just throw all of them into this Everyone's same doing it. competitive field. How is SpaceX <laughs> different? How do you think you'll sort of surpass them? Well, you know, you listed a, a wide range of, of entities there, mm -hmm. and I think the differences are really different depending upon which one you're referring to. Well, let me ask you this question. Yeah. Who is your competition? We have no serious competition. None? Not presently. Who's chasing you? Well, if you mean chasing and have a serious chance of catching, then I, I think none that I'm aware of. And, so and, that and by Branson the, guy's kind of a hack then? Well, what Branson's doing, by the way, I'm a great admirer of Branson, is really a much smaller technological challenge. So their craft would be suborbital, so it would go to about Mach 3. Our craft is orbital, 
it goes to Mach 25, so 25 times the speed of sound. But that doesn't describe the whole scale of difficulty, because the energy required to get to those velocities scales as the square of the velocity. So to do what Branson is doing, you need, say, about 9 units of energy. To do what we're doing, you need 625 units of energy. The difference is monumental. And then when you re-enter, you have to burn off all that energy. So that doubles the problem, really. So I mean, what Branson is doing from a technological standpoint is building something that can cross the, the English Channel. What we're building is something that can circumnavigate the globe. It's a very different uh, scale of technological difficulty. I still think what he's doing is great. And by the way, I bought a ticket on his effort. You did? Uh, yeah, yeah. So I, I, I still think it's great, but it's not the same league technologically. So you're not particularly worried? Certainly not about that, no. Uh, the things that worry me are, are we going to make a mistake? The things that can really hurt SpaceX are our own foolishness. Our own errors can, can hurt us, but not, none of the competition that I'm aware of. Mm -hmm. So generally, you're worried about what's in front of you, not the other guy. In, in fact, you probably don't think about them in terms of the, how they criticize you or what they think about you. Yeah, actually, I don't think there's much criticism. I mean, Boeing and Lockheed, of course, they, they would criticize, but I don't think any of the entrepreneurial guys would, would criticize what we're doing. And it's certainly possible, I think, you know, what, what Jeff Bezos is working on could ultimately, I mean, he does have aspirations to get to orbit and beyond. It's just that what they're doing right now is suborbital and at the sort of lower technology level. What I think about at SpaceX is really entirely w w what are we doing to ensure that our rocket is, is going to be successful and that we are truly optimizing the cost and ensuring a higher liability. I mean, that's just a very, very difficult problem. And there's a reason why there's an idiom idiomatic expression about rocket science being hard. It, it really is really hard. So rocket <laughs> science really is rocket science. Yeah. <laughs> it looks hard and it's harder than it looks. What's the big goal here? What's the long-term plan? Well, the long-term ultimate objective, the Holy Grail, is we would like to help make life multiplanetary. That's really our, what we'd like to do. So establish societies on as many planets as possible? Uh, well, yeah. Well, I think there's only one possibility, but yeah. I mean, even if we can just go from one planet to two, I think that's a pretty big step. And you'll start with? Well, Mars. Mars, Mars? is the only viable planet. Viable planet. Yeah. So multiplanetary life. Yeah. It's h help make life multiplanetary. I think that's an important thing. I don't think your goal's big enough. Ha! Yeah? It's ambitious. Well, like I said, it's, we don't, don't expect to do it single-handedly, but we certainly would like to help make it happen. It's fair to say you've made a fortune. Yeah, I think so, by you any have. reasonable standard, yeah. And, you know, those who work in science probably understand your trajectory, but there are those who are watching who would think, if I made that money, I'd sit on a beach, I'd drink beer, and I would just watch the sunset, kind of like a Corona beer commercial. Have you ever thought about that as a career option? Uh, you know, I find that really pretty boring. So <laughs> that would be torture if I had to do that every day. That would really be pretty awful for me. Is there something about startup businesses that that really fuels your desire to work? Well, I guess I really need to be preoccupied with something. And if I'm just sort of sitting there relaxing, I can only do that for a very short period of time, and then it becomes unbearable. Mm -hmm. um, although startups definitely have their highs and lows. And as a friend of mine who has a good phrase, uh, you know, a startup business is like eating glass and staring into the abyss. What is the criteria that you establish for yourself for a startup? I mean, why one business over another? Yeah. Well, for me, it's always about, is this, does what I'm doing matter? If, if we are successful, uh, d does it matter to the world? And uh, so there are easier ways to make money than starting a rocket company or, a, say, a car company. Or, or even when I started an internet company, because when I started the first internet company, uh, nobody had made any money, and it wasn't clear that anyone would make any money. Uh, it was simply from the perspective of the internet being a very important thing and something that needed to be built, and so I wanted to help build it. Well, you touch upon something that's interesting, is that there is is a, that benefiting humanity is a very integral part of your criteria, no matter what you're starting up. Yes, absolutely. Really? Not everybody has that as a prime interest. Most no, I, th people... I think that's probably relatively unusual. There are many people that I know in Silicon Valley for whom that is a significant motivation. You said in your endeavor here to explore space that we are committed to failing in a new way, if nothing else. <laughs> what did you mean by that? Just, just, just how it sounds? Well, I mean, I mean, we're committed to succeed, really. But, <laughs> uh, but if we do fail, uh, I would hope that we at least add to the body of knowledge such that those who follow may make fewer mistakes. Mm -hmm. uh, now, if Mars were not enough, you are busy here on <laughs> Earth. The world is not enough. <laughs> That's right. Where, you, where, where, what? Uh, have you no limits, my friend? Uh, here on Earth, you are establishing a uh, presence, certainly, uh, with Tesla Motors. Tell us a little bit about that. This is your electric car company, correct? Right. And this is no hybrid car you could buy on a car lot. This thing goes from zero to 60 in four seconds. Is and, that right? Yes, absolutely. Zero to 60 in under four seconds. It's faster, a better acceleration than any uh, Porsche currently in production and any Ferrari except the Enzo. Um, and it's uh, twice the energy efficiency of a Prius. You really have uh, the moral high ground, and you get uh, 
you know, leave uh, the Ferrari guy in your dust. Let me ask the obvious, well, and you don't look like one of those guys who's trying too hard in a Ferrari. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, you don't we, look like a jerk, you know. You don't so. look <laughs> <laughs> in a bright banana yellow uh, Lamborghini or, or, uh, or a Ferrari. Uh, but, you know, there's something I should point out about Tesla, which is the first car is, is a sports car, not because we think the world lacks for a sports car, but because it is the right entry point for the market. If you have a new technology, the right place to enter is high unit cost, low unit volume. Uh, just as, you know, when a new cell phone comes out, comes out or a new a new laptop or, or some some new thing uh, it tends to be expensive at first uh, because they're, they're figuring out all the issues and it takes time to optimize and then over time that that technology will become cheaper and cheaper and so the model 2 of, of tesla maybe i'm leaping ahead here but model 2 of tesla is a forty nine thousand dollar four-door five passenger sedan and that's uh, going to be obviously a much broader market segment uh, that can make use of that car and then model 3 is intended to be around a thirty thousand dollar price point so that's that's really affordable by by almost everyone who can buy a new car so the idea is to drive to mass market as rapidly as possible but only at the pace at which the technology matures is henry ford uh, someone you admire well i think Henry Ford made some very important contributions to to business and obviously you know moving manufacturing line and sort of thing. Uh, so I think he's certainly worthy of admiration. Uh, he was a bit of an odd duck, but you know certainly noteworthy. But the interest in Tesla is, is not from the perspective of you know the world needs another car company. It's more from the perspective of we have a very important environmental problem that needs to be addressed, which is driven by the, the burning of fossil fuels and uh, the, the increasing CO2 concentration in the atmosphere and gl and global climate change, which I think is going to be one of the most significant issues of the 21st century. And the only way to, to really get around that, in my view, is, is really with an electric vehicle. And then you need to pair that up with a zero emission power generation method, such as uh, solar power. Mm -hmm. I think is, solar power is going to be a really big deal. Tesla is not a hybrid car. Tesla is pure electric. Pure electric. Yeah. So help connect the dots for me. Why aren't we seeing Tesla cars on the car lots then? It's keeping them we haven't down. made them yet. Just finishing up the development right now. And anybody can buy this? Yes. How will well, you? Well, actually, we've almost sold out of 2007 production. So if somebody does want to buy next year's model, they, they better act quickly. One of the primary complaints about hybrid vehicles is they're not fast enough. You yeah. seem to overcome yeah, you won't, this. You won't have any trouble with this. In fact, there's something uniquely better about electric vehicles, which is that the torque response is immediate. So if you want to pass someone, I mean, you just the response of the car is, is very immediate. It's just, it's more fun to drive an electric car than it is to drive a gasoline car. You know, I was going to say that Tesla, the car, the name of the car company is no coincidence, is it? Explain a little bit about that. The company's named after Nikola Tesla, who is an inventor. He was originally from sort of the area of Yugoslavia and Europe, but he moved to America when he was young and, and was uh, an inventor of the, the AC induction motor, invented a lot of the principles of magnetism. So he, he was a great man, a great, great inventor and this, so the company's named in honor of him. So these cars, the Tesla Roadster, the first issue of the Tesla Roadster, available in 2007. Yes. In the spring, the summer? How do you get on the waiting list? Well, you buy the car, you, you basically put down a deposit. Can you do that through the web? Uh, yeah, we'll have, by the way, customer centers all around the country. So we'll have one in LA, one in, the, in Chicago, Miami, New York, and eventually nationwide customer centers uh, where somebody does want to see the car in person, take a test drive, or see the car being worked on. I mean, we have this idea for the way that the cars are serviced that it should be a really, a really pleasant experience. So, so we have some, somewhere between like a Starbucks and an Apple store. Uh -huh. So you'd go in and you'd see the car being, the cars being worked on behind a glass partition. That would be your car you're watching? Yeah, or, or somebody else's. Okay. Yeah, and, and, but it's really clean. It's really mm -hmm. clean, present, bright. You know, there'll be sort of a, a you know, coffee bar available. You know, just a, we really want to have a very pleasant experience that, that you don't typically get if you go into a dealership. Have you heard from Toyota? Have you heard from General Motors and Ford saying, uh, is the company for sale? Nobody's actually made a formal offer, but the interest, I think one of the biggest values that, that Tesla can provide is serving as an example to the rest of the auto industry, because right now the big car companies believe that A, a viable electric vehicle is not possible, and B, if, even if it was, people wouldn't buy it. Mm -hmm. So we need to show that, that neither of those are true, that the technology works, that people want to buy it, and, and that will be the most effective way of really driving change change in the, in the auto industry is by serving as an example in that manner. And if we were to sell the company to one of the big car companies, I think it would really slow things down. Mm -hmm. You think so? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. You're very busy enterprising the part of your company that will explore space. You're very busy with this car company. Where do you find time to be CEO of two companies that size? Well, I should correct you that I'm CEO of, of SpaceX. I'm, I'm chairman and CEO of, of SpaceX, and that is really my day job. So I spend 80% of my time on SpaceX. Okay. I am the chairman 
am the principal owner of Tesla Motors, uh, but I do not run it on a daily basis. You don't run that on a daily basis? No. Well, uh, that was really the question. How do you run those two large enterprises on a daily basis? Is it a couple of phone calls to the Tesla folks? How's it going? I'm busy with outer space right now. You yeah. guys got that covered? I, I, I spend about two, two to three days a month on Tesla-related business, and almost all the rest of the time is on SpaceX. So SpaceX is very much my my day-to-day -day job. Mm -hmm. um, and then I provide product guidance, strategic guidance, and uh, and obviously funding for, for Tesla. Like Steve Jobs, right? So he runs Apple on a daily basis, but he also, you know, has uh, oversight over Pixar. It's, it's kind of like that. Mm -hmm. And in your day-to-day, -day, this is one of those silly lifestyle questions, but how early do you get up in the morning? And where do you go to work physically? Is it an office? Yeah, I, I go to work at SpaceX. At How SpaceX early do you office. get up in the morning? You know, I'm not an early morning person. Uh, so so you, uh, like for young engineers and right. for inventors and creators, they can sleep in until 10 or 11? We have no fixed hours at SpaceX. <laughs> uh, and my, I mean, my personally, uh, I, I, would t I tend to get up around 7.30 or 8.00. Be in okay. the office around you know nine nine thirty, uh, but then I tend to stay to about till about eight p.m. Okay, college students across America are saying, "Oh, drats!" I thought he was going to say like noon. But then you go into an office and you you sit with uh, in a separate office away from those who are working, or do you sit with? Them? No, I just have a cubicle at SpaceX. You have a cubicle. Yeah. And are you surrounded by your colleagues there? Yeah, and absolutely. What is your hope in terms of the impact you will leave on culture, this civilization? this world, global civilization, what is it that you hope to leave here? Well, I think what I'd like to do is help solve some important problems. So I think in a small way, I helped build the internet. Uh, and, and then with respect to the global warming problem, the, the transition from uh, away from oil and other hydro hydrocarbons to, to something which is clean and sustainable, I hope to have an impact there. And then with respect to space, I hope to have an impact in helping make humanity a multi-planet species. Elon Musk, thank you so much right. for being with us at Wired Science. Uh, let me get it straight. CEO of SpaceX and chairman of Tesla Motors. Yeah, I got other titles, but that's about right. I think that you're doing pretty good. <laughs> I think you've done very well.